Pacers are growing and improving in year one of their new rebuild, but how well have they done through 60 games and with 22 to go? That's what we're talking about today. Mark Schindler from Indy Cornrows and many other places of the basketball sphere are going to join us to talk about it. Uh, I also asked Rick Carlisle and Miles Turner about it at practice today, so we'll get into their comments before talking about the Pacers' focus for their last 22 games. Let's do it. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today the Pacers are back. For the stretch run, 22 games to go, less than three games out of the plan, yet also the sixth lottery pick. Very interesting stretch run coming for this team. I want to talk about what this stretch run could look like in terms of development and winning and growth and all sorts of buzzwords that are important for a young team that is exceeding expectations like the Pacers. And joining me to do that, you probably heard his voice talking about the Pacers just as much, if not more than mine, formerly from the Indy Cornrows sphere of Pacer land, now covering the NBA for Dime Up Rocks and covering basketball at many places. It's Mark Schindler. Mark, Ohio, not doing so great. But how are you doing right now? Yeah, it's uh, it's rainy as heck today. So it has <laughs> been uh, – Moose has been very upset about it because he has not gone on any walks today. But he doesn't like being in the rain anyway, so I don't know what he's upset about. But, um, no, I'm doing good, man. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited that you asked me to, to be on and we could, we could make it work. So how's everything on your end? You do everything, so I always feel bad taking your time, but I'm glad we could get 30 minutes to talk about this because this was kind of what I wanted to talk about at practice today, actually, for the Pacers back uh, and and showing up. Um, Rick Carlisle and Miles Turner, I asked them about this because at Media Day, I asked Rick Carlisle, Rick, what would success look like for you this season? Because no one expected the Pacers to be a a play-in contender or playoff team, whatever. Mm -hmm. And he talked about, Uh, I think you and Caitlin even discussed this, like seeing week to week and month to month growth within a young team and them getting better at the same time, this team also has been winning. So it's like the priorities have kind of changed, but the way Carlisle answered it today, when I said, how have you seen that happen this year? Where have you seen that growth happen? And he said, you know, it's been interesting because they go on a lot of, of streaks, right? They were bad to start the season, then really good November, then not as good early December, then great at Christmas and New Year's, then obviously since Tyrese's injury, they've been miserable. And then when I asked Miles Turner about the question, he also kind of talked about that streakiness and getting that consistency back and things like that. And I'm curious what you think as you look at this team's kind of growth as the season progresses, uh, how much you think their streakiness is kind of based on the fact that they're a young team is it like the way they adjust to things how have you kind of seen them progress in that way yeah that's a good question I think uh like you mentioned the Tyrese injury has just completely derailed their season and where they were going um and I think in some ways it makes me really fascinated just to see what the last 20 games is going to look like based on that and like you mentioned I know we'll, we'll talk about some of the comments from um Rick in the front office but um I, I don't want to say that it's stagnated recently, but it's kind of felt like it um, in some ways. Like, obviously, the stuff with Benedict, like, I don't want to be overly harsh. I still think he's shown a lot of very good things. But, um, you know, the shot just hasn't really been there since the start of the new year. He's not getting the line as much. Um, the defense has really held him back from just playing. I mean, that's – but I. I know Rick mentioned that. Uh, uh, I actually don't even know if Rick mentioned it, but I think just from watching, like I think I've been more understanding of Benedict's playing time um, than I think a lot of fans have been. Uh, like some of it has been a little bit like, okay, why is he playing like 15 minutes? Like that's a little weird to me. But on the other hand, like his defense has been horrendous, but it's also considering that it really hasn't gotten better at all this year. Um, so I think on one hand, I get that. Um I don't want to bang the Daniel Tystrom over and over again. Um, <laughs> but like that has been, I think that's been like a, a thing of frustration for me and as an analyst and like the stuff with Ajax has just been kind of wonky, especially with how, you know, I was going to wait to complain until after the trade deadline. So I waited to complain until after the trade deadline because it continued. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just, I'm, I'm in a weird spot with the, the team because um, kind of like you mentioned with the, uh, 
with just the comments in general about them wanting to to develop while winning, it's like, well, A, you're not winning. B, you're trying to win games. And I don't know if the de- – like, not that development can't happen during it, but just with some of the stuff going on, it's just, I, I don't know. I will say, though, the development of Aaron Neesmith this year has been really fun. And I think it's meaningful. Like, it's not perfect. I, I Ideally, not a starter. Um, I think, like, that as much as – uh, you and I and Caitlin and anybody covering the, the beat this year has praised what your Aaron e. Smith has become. I th- still think it's pretty clear. Like it, I mean, like they need a real starter at the three or at the four. Um, and I mean, hopefully he can continue to grow on that. But again, the shots just really consistent. Anything off the dribble is a mystery and an adventure of all ways and forms. Um, but yeah, I mean, like there's there's definitely good 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 stuff with it, but it's also been a little bit of uh, kind of not really super sure what to make out of the last month. There's a lot of buzzwords that I would could use to talk about kind of the way that that this season has gone for them. But when when I asked Turner this question at practice today about you know that like I said that month to month, week to week improvement or whatever, he I, I think it was him. I might have been Rick. Either way, one of them said something interesting about how. You know, as this team has gotten better and more together, they have a problem in front of them and they solve it. But in doing so, something else is now an issue, whether that's a rotation change leads to something else or a defensive scheme change. They give up something else or whatever it is. It's it's like, doesn't that analogy usually come in the form of a boat taking on water where you like you plug one hole and then another one opens? You know, it's like that is something that I think has been an issue for them where, you know, they figure out. Okay, Jalen Smith starting is not working for us. We have this new lineup that works, but now our bench is worse. But now we don't know what big man should be playing. And like, okay, you know, we figured out how to defend a little better in in that mid-December stretch. But then all of a sudden teams adjust to our new scheme and how we're using miles. And all of a sudden our defense stinks again. And hey, look, we are, you know, really killing it in the clutch with Tyrese Albert. Uh Oh, we don't have him. We don't have a good clutch situation. All of a sudden it's like all these things that have been this revolving door of issues they figure out how to stop that problem but then another one comes and so i don't think that that's like a bad thing that that happens right because that's why i put this in as a bullet point like that's kind of what a young team learning look looks like right is like you solve one problem and you figure it out and then in the future when you're a better team you already know how to overcome that issue as a team but they're dealing with all the problems that's good and and the thing that's kind of impressed me about this team actually is even within a game or, you know, one game to the next, they're really good at adjusting to specific challenges. Like, I think that's why they get so much better throughout the course of a game, but they still have a lot of issues that they have to plug and solve. And that's why they're 26 and 34. Right. And so that was, I think really an interesting an- an answer. I can't, I-, I feel bad that I discredited it to Turner when it could have been Rick. I can't remember. It was one of those two. Cause that's the only two. It's I the asked. same person. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only two I asked the question to. Yeah. Either way, they both kind of talked about similar things. So I think something that I'll be interested in in these last 22 games is be- beyond the development versus win spark, which we'll talk about, is like, can they find some breath of consistency? They had it for a little bit, I would say, from mid-December to when Halliburton got hurt in early January, when there were five games over 500, exactly at the halfway point. They were good in the similar way every game. Now, granted, they had some ridiculous and potentially unsustainable clutch play in that stretch, but they, they were good. Like they were really good in that time. Can they even get, can, can they even be a consistent team for these 22 games? Even if they go, whatever eight and 14 or something, if, if they have a similar blueprint, every game or something that you go, okay, yeah, that's how they're going to play when they're good. I think that would be a, a win and refreshing for this team, given kind of how the first 60 have gone. Yeah, uh, and I think also, too, just to point out, because I do think they're – I haven't been as tapped in with Pacers Twitter this year just because I've been a little bit all over the place. But I think, you know, I have seen some more like, oh, well, let's just lose as much as possible the last 20 games. A, even if you do, not I, you're not going to lose more games than Charlotte, San Antonio, or yeah, Houston, not and you're not catching up to the four seed. Like, it would be right. it would take an act of God in both directions. Oh, my gosh, we got to five yeah. instead of six. And Orlando's yeah. already playing well. Yeah. Exactly. I think like that is feasible. Orlando's been like a legitimate playoff team since about Christmas. Um, and I think that could could hold for sure moving forward. I think that they're still going to want one more bite at the apple and get a better uh, lottery pick. Um, 
But I think, you know, with the way that both teams have been trending, like I think, yeah, it's it's definitely I, I wouldn't be shocked at all if they fall to if they fall to five and Orlando goes to six. But um yeah, I think like again, because then that 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 talks about what the purpose is. Like, all right, well, they're probably they're not even they're not good, but they're too they have too many guys who are capable of like raising the floor for them to be that level of bad. And also you don't want them to be. Like again, like you it's at the interesting point of like, well, we don't want to develop bad habits um, and have just like, obviously they're not like trying to take games, but you know what I mean? Like it's, I, I don't know. Like I, I don't have like a great answer for what it's going to look like or how it should play out. But um, mainly I think it's just, all right, continue to get run for Chris Duarte as you captain, continue to get run for, for Benedict and trying to find ways to, to make them more playable. Not that, I mean, I think Chris has been a little bit better recently and mainly it's more just because Benedict has not been awesome. But I think it's like, I look at them like the last 20 games, the, the best way that can happen for me is if you can get to a point where you're comfortable with multiple young guys closing games, um, or you can at least see scenario, like Rick is comfortable with scenarios with those guys playing, or like you're at least trending in that direction. Cause to me, that's, that's what the growth probably is over the back end of the season. Hey guys, let's take one short little break here. So I could talk to you about FanDuel with the midway point of the NBA season being here. It's the perfect time to download FanDuel America's number one sports book because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back. If your first bet doesn't win, just download the FanDuel sports book app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to threes drained and more. They have their exclusive bets like their two by three, two three pointers made in the first three minutes, player props uh, on anything, a lot of markets in there to check out. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at bigger pass with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com. Slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. I'd like to thank everybody for making Locked On Pacers their first listen today and every single day. Hop on over to Locked On Clippers next to hear Darian talk about Russell Westbrook being on the Clippers. I have lots of questions about that. I will hold them until I see the Clippers play instead of having an internet, an internet outrage like many people liked to. Although I did have lots of crazy thoughts about that. Um, Yeah, I think those are all really good points about the upcoming you know, part of the season and especially with Chris right like where, where does he fit in he had a DNP in the first game when when Jordan Wara came back came into the mix excuse me I thought that was completely ludicrous and that I don't think will be a thing going forward but it was for one night which was which was crazy um and and to that end like that's kind of what these last 22 will be about is is figuring out those lineups that you can have and more about the discovery while still trying to win and we'll talk about that balance more going forward but yeah that is a lot of what this team has tr been trying to tackle and and the the trouble with the t word is like they're too good you know they have yeah. like an all-star talent on their team now who's 22 like they're going to play him every game they're going to be good enough to win stuff so you know trot that team out and figure out what works around them how to develop guys how to find that consistency and that's one of the things i think in the last 22 i'll be looking for like i said is, is should have been that consistency but also like some defensive improvement would be I think pretty meaningful for this group. They had that stretch. I, I don't know how, if I need to dig in to see if there was like some crazy shooting luck in here, but for a, a whole month, a little over a month of the season, right from late November through Christmas, they were a top 10 good defensive team. Like we're stopping people from scoring when we have to. And that was, I think an underrated problem for them. The first year under Carlisle, that team was completely miserable, but that team stunk in the clutch, and everybody always said they don't have a closer, they can't score in the clutch. I'm like, they can't stop anybody. I don't, yeah, I don't really know that they can or can't score. Like they kind of can't. But like Brogdon's an okay clutch player. We've seen Zabonis do some stuff. Like they can't, they have the like the worst defense in the league. They can't stop anybody. This year's team could at least for a stretch. Like oh wow, they they can stop guys, and then that kind of went away. And some of it is the classic reaction of you no know, Tyrese. You're not you know you're not scoring as much. You're playing in transition. more. like, I understand all those things weaving together and why that matters and, and all that and, and how it changes your identity. And like now TJ McConnell starting. So like now your bench defenses was like, I get how all these interactions make sense together. But uh, even since he's come back, their defense hasn't been as good. 
So I, I would like to see defensive growth from this team down the stretch just to see what it would look like or what players are involved in it or is it a schematic thing i don't even know that i'm a student enough to really notice like a significant defensive scheme change but um i think that would be pretty meaningful for this group because matherin and, and halliburton they, they could score right like among the many flaws of, of both of them defensively like we know that they can score and that means i think as the pacers build progresses they're going to be at least floor i have a floor of good on offense right so can they defend well or can they find the pieces around those two guys that can defend well i think that will be pretty meaningful in these final 22 yeah and i think i I, i'm with you in terms of what they did in december um like that was that felt like a real meaningful stretch it felt like they were pretty locked in and and communicating well and i think a lot of it too was like i mean miles played really well defensively really Um, well yeah um so that was a big part of it but also i think it's just again like they I, i don't really know what shook loose what was working for them like, I think maybe part of that was teams just kind of figuring it out a little bit more. And I think, like like you mentioned as well, I think part of it was the offense. Like, the offense started to die down. I think that contributed a lot to the defense falling apart. But, um, I, I, I mean, they continue to have just a lot of the same problems of really not being able to stop anybody on the perimeter. Um, unless, I mean, like they can for, like, small stretches. But for entire games, they just get put in rotation all the time. But, yeah, um, it's weird. Uh, I I don't mean to take over your podcast, but I didn't need to ask you. What did you think of the Jordan Moore trade? uh, They gave up nothing effectively. So like trade value. Yeah. Win. Like you get, you get assets for nothing. You do that, especially because they need forwards, right? Like Wara is a forward, take a flyer on one, play him, see if it works out. And, you know, uh, the the tricky part is, is now you're kind of tasked because of the way the rotation is built and the resources you have of playing him or Brissett the rest of the season. And it's hard to explore both at the same time, but you would like to know which ones fit well and fit better. And Aura has a negative year on his contract and Brissett doesn't. So like in a vacuum, you'd say, yeah, the guy at the expiring contract, you should play because you know, you need to know if you want to resign him or not, but this is unrelated to what you're saying, but they, they just got war. They need to see how he fits and how he plays and all this stuff. But you know, um, you got they got something for nothing so from a trade perspective it's good from a basketball perspective i i just i don't know what wara is i think that i have a lot i I have a lot of respect for the strategy of that they pulled off with jalen smith and aaron neesmith of these guys these young guys on good teams that can't get on the court let's try to get them and put them in an environment i I, to to tie this to the jazz i I heard taylor horton tucker talk about this earlier this season right one of the big things for him in getting better this year is with the Lakers, they said, be good at these things because we're trying to win. And so when you're out there, if you can do these things that will help us, the Lakers win, if you can shoot and defend and make one dribble moves. And then he goes to Utah and the jazz are like, we're going to get you better at everything, (laughs) all these skills. And that's going to make you a better player because we don't care about how you help us win right now. We want you to be good and helpful in the future. And so I think that, Applying that to the Pacers, that helped Jalen Smith, that helped Aaron e. Smith, and so you know George Hill is a vet, whatever. Like everybody knows what he is at this stage. Hey, Before, I think George the hope is, on, th- is that it's something similar in that he comes here and it's not. Here's what you do to help us, the Bucks, win: shoot, score, please defend. Even though he didn't there it's very not, well, no. <laughs> not, not a no. good defense. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, so that, it would, I mean, not to not to get on my horse, but it was funny because I. Uh, as soon as the trade happened, I like automatically tweeted. I was like, I like, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm like, they trade a second round pick. I can't be bothered. Like who cares? Like, yeah, that's, that's good value, whatever. But I automatically was like, this guy just does not fit, fit what Rick likes at all. I know that they <laughs> like went to bat for him in the press conference, but I was like, he hasn't played a wicked defense since he was at Louisville. Um, even in Louisville, like, and it's not even just like a effort thing. Why like, he fell? That's why he went in the second round. I mean, he's really slow like for somebody his size for what he has to play like he's he's really only big enough and strong enough to guard threes but he's way too slow to guard threes and he's not really strong enough to guard fours and his off ball awareness kind of sucks like he's can can i give you my long-standing opinion on forwards what if you are between six six and six ten honestly if you probably even shorter than that if you can do one of these two things you can be in a rotation for an nba team if you can shoot threes 
or play defense. You don't even have to do both. You only have to do one at a good level to play, not necessarily have like yeah. a big impact, but just play. And and I agree with you that War is not a good defender, but he can shoot. Like he definitely can shoot. So I think he should play, right? Like Doug yeah. McDermott plays and gets paid a lot to do it. Now, granted, he's an elite shooter, especially off movement and has a million other skills. But if you, you just have to do one if you're in the right size range to help. And he is in the size range and he can shoot. And I think that's worth exploring, even if yeah, I sure. agree with all the things you said. Especially the tricky part for him and his speed is the Bucks played slow, so it's fine. Pacers play super fast, yeah. so it's a little harder. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting the dynamics to see play out, but like kind of like you spoke on in exactly what you're mentioning about THT. That's where it just feels weird with this team. Um, because like I, I mean, that's exactly what you want. Like you want them to be able to explore young guys and get them there a bit help them grow in all facets of the game. And I just wonder sometimes, like obviously I'm not, I'm not trying to imply that I'm smarter than Rick or know more about player development than him, but I do wonder like, okay, maybe they, maybe pulling guys because of their defensive lapses isn't the way, like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what the answer is with that. Like I, I, I think that there obviously has to be some kind of rain in with that. Cause you can't just let somebody go out there and play 37 minutes and, um, be like, oh, well, we'll just cover it and film the next day. Like, it's not that simple. But um, at the same time, like, it just has been a little bit odd to watch um, in, like, trying to parse through what they want this team to be this year or what it was supposed to be this year. And um, it's just a little vexing. Like, if this is what they thought this year was going to be, then I'm just kind of of the opinion of, like, well, why didn't you just trade Isaiah Jackson? Like, I don't think that he is a guy who can just – like, we've seen, like, he's too good to play in the G League. He dominates the yep. G League because he's so athletic and capable of just beasting people there. Like, he needs real NBA reps over and over again. And, again, like, KP won on that, that – and I appreciated him saying it, but, like, he was honest in saying, like, you know, part of the reason Goga failed is because of me. And, I I mean, hey, man, it's – I'm not saying it's happening again, but we're trending towards that. Um, <laughs> we'll get and, to that. Wait, yeah. that, that's coming Sorry. very soon. I have one more point to make, but we'll get to mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and look, the, the last thing to touch on before we get to that actually is I, I think that they are trying very hard, and this was part of what they said today when I asked this question. Again, I, I feel like I'm circling back to that too much of of process, right? And we, you know, the buzzword is championship habits, blah, blah, blah. No team's going to want to build not championship habits, but, you know, like the learning the process of like how to get better, how to problem solve as a unit and as a player. And like, yes, that is what I view as kind of the, the goal and challenge of these upcoming 20 something games. And I think that if you're harping on a point with a guy a lot and he messes it up in a game a couple of times, like, yeah, you have to pull him. Like you have to be like, dude, we're focusing on these details. Like they've talked about details a lot recently, like do them or you're not going to play. Like, I think there is something to that. You you can't just, have, I, I don't want to pick on a team because I don't think that this is entirely what to do, but like Houston, it feels like there's like unlimited leash for some of these young guys and it hasn't necessarily been helpful for them, but you can't have too short of a leash either. Right. And finding that balance yeah. will be key in these last 22 games. And to that end, now we get to the quote that we've kind of referenced a lot. Kevin Pritchard said it right in his pressure. He said, we can develop while winning. And I think there is something to that. Uh, and Rick's kind of talked about it too. Uh, while well, you try to win and develop guys at the same time. And some of that is just that, you know, what is it, a dozen, I think? Uh, there there have been birthdays during the season. My stat before the season was they have a dozen players 25 or younger. I think that some guys have aged out of that because time has passed. But they have a young team, right? So by default, many young guys are going to play. And I and I talked about this very recently. I think is yesterday on the show. Like, veterans help young guys get better. Like, Buddy Hill providing spacing is helpful to, like, attack the basket better and mm -hmm. play off of a shooter and tj mcconnell actually being able to set someone up is like helpful for guys to attack a disadvantaged defense and miles turner's defense like i don't have to recycle the same points but like there is value to playing some vets with your young guys like every rebuilding team has some vets in the mix and the other thing i think that is under discussed in the whole developing my winning thing is like you don't play every day like there's film there's practice and there's walkthroughs and there's all sorts of other things you do that matter but every player for all of time has also said a big part of staying warm, staying ready and getting better is playing <laughs> in games. Right. So there is also something to that part of it. And so that's the final part of this last 22 that I'll be curious how it goes is 
does the pendulum swing more to, you mentioned his name already, someone like Isaiah Jackson playing more than not even Daniel Tice, but just playing more, getting on the floor. Can he? Is he playing the four? Is he, are they mixing things up in that way? Can they get Jalen Smith out there? And it could even extend farther than that. Can they find a way to get Brissett out there with work? Can they get Kendall Brown some minutes somehow? Like like that. that's a little extreme because that's kind of like, you know, you're you're probably not winning if you're playing him a ton with yeah. with with no shade. Well, to hey, Kendall I mean, Brown, the, won the Golden State game with him playing what? Like, yeah, I was gonna say he yeah, had a, no, yeah. a good good. Oh god, that feels State. like a and millennia better, ago. But, Like you get what I'm saying. You know? mm-hmm. So that is what I'll be curious about: is can they find a way to swing the pendulum a little bit more towards young guy minutes while still doing what they want to do in terms of ingraining good habits and processes and trying to win? And it's hard. Like every team ever. And it's, you know, you have different human elements to this, but every team ever has tried to find the perfect balance in that growth plan. And the Pacers will be the next team trying to do it. And I think it's hard, but I think it's important that they, they swing a little bit more towards the youth side, I think in these last 20 some. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's uh, exactly what you said. And I think um, it's not every player, but I think most players really do just need the game time to, to really learn. And I think like you can look at Isaiah's minutes be like, well, you know, he did, this, this, and that. And I, so much of it is coming in garbage time because of how much they've been losing. So it's like, it's not, uh, it's not like a perfect one-to-one thing. Um, the stuff with Jalen, I think is just even more confusing to me too, because like, like you mentioned, I mean, the guaranteed starting spot just has not been a, that, that did not work. Yeah, um, that was, that didn't, but work. for him to just go to straight D and I mean, he's played more than 10 minutes per game. Uh, twice three times the whole year like 2023 something like that four times yeah yeah like it's been not a lot um so i mean he's dmp'd more than he's played games in uh well okay it's tied in the month of february but if you go out <laughs> if you go out one day he's, he's dmp'd more than played but that works I'll tell and it's just it. like i don't i feel like that's just way too much of a knee-jerk reaction for what he was doing like he wasn't awesome but I, I don't know. It's the, just, the front it's court. Weird. I will give a tiny bit of grace. Yeah. Remove even remove Tice. Like you have Turner, Brissett, Jackson, Smith. Now Wara's in the mix. And Neesmith plays the four sometimes. Like that. That is just too many guys to like yeah. reasonably play every game. But yes, the the pendulum did swing. Sorry, keep going. No, you're good. Remove Tice. Like what they should have done in the trade deadline. But I uh, well, if you yeah. can't get anything for him, don't just like. For yeah. no reason, but yes, I get what you're saying. Yeah, no, I know I'm being rude. I'm sure he's a wonderful person, but yeah, it's just I don't know, man. Uh, no, I don't think I have anything too much to, to add on that. Like, I mean, they have just really struggled with a lot of guys kind of regressing, like even Nemhart, his shots really regressed from, yep. from earlier in the year, and that's hurt him. Like, he's been more hesitant to shoot it too. Um, so it's it's just weird, but I also think like it's just uh, it's tough knowing how. I don't want to speak out of turn, but like knowing how much Rick is part of the reason some of these guys are here, like Chris and Benedict, like it does make it like, okay, like figure it out. Like, I, I don't know. Like it's, it is a little bit, it's just, it's just kind of vexing. This team has really thrown me for a loop over the last month or so. Rick loves being the teacher and loves all these young guys and they all really look up to him and his, the way he teaches and coaches, right? Like I think again, from an external perspective, I understand what people are saying, but that relationship is close with a lot of the young guys as they grow. And Matherin has said, Rick's talked about this, like Matherin has said to him, like, I would like to be coached hard, right? I think that yeah. is an interesting part of this too, as a layer to peel back. But yeah, you know, and and I'll be curious how they sort all this out. Like I said, even removing ties, like there's not a lot of minutes available to get everybody out there, but who do you, uh, who do you sit? How do you figure that out? What do you even prioritize among the guys that you have in terms of skill development and positional exploration and skill exploration and all this sort of stuff? I say positional exploration because, like, I think Isaiah Jackson can play the four a little bit. They tried Jalen Smith at the four a little bit. Andrew Nembard, for example, was a point guard his whole life until this season. Like, can you try to get him some minutes at the one? They've been playing TJ and Tyrese together some stuff. Like, there's a lot to peel back here. And I, 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 there are ways to develop and win. Like, teams do it. But also, it's really hard. And, like, the Warriors are the opposite side of this, where they tried the two timelines thing. And the Pacers are not doing two timelines. I'm not even pretending, like, <laughs> there's a, a winning timeline and a development timeline for the Pacers. Like, it's really hard to win and develop at the same time. That's why Aaron E. Smith and Jalen Smith did better in Indiana than with their old teams, because 
when there's more of a focus on one than the other, it makes more sense and why the war I bet makes sense. So, um, yeah, I think that there is, there is a way to do it, develop and win at the same time. They were doing it for November and December and parts of January. Um, but at the same time, it is very hard to do with the roster as it's built. And the front court rotation, I think, will be tricky these last 20 some and They'll have to sort it out, I think, this summer in some way. And another part that Kevin said with the Goga part of this that you brought up is like some of the center trades just kind of like fell to them, right? Like Tice, I think, was needed salary in the Brogdon trade. Like that just kind of happened, right? Jalen Smith has been great, but also like that trading Tory Craig, that, that was the last domino of that deadline was to make it so that if they if every player hit their bonuses, they're not paying the tax, right? Like <laughs> that was also again, he turned out to be great for them, but that was also sort of financially motivated. Like centers have, he's right, fallen into their lap, but now they're still dealing with that for the rest of this season. So I'll be curious how they sort it out and how they how they balance it out. But that is among them trying to become more consistent and, and figure out how to plug more holes without more opening, something they'll have to figure out down the stretch. Yeah, um, it's... Yeah, exactly your mission. Like, I, I don't want to put like too much on this end because it got exactly so, like <laughs> that was part of the uh, I mean, that's part of what they had to do to make deals work. But it's still just like, I, I don't know. And it's not as easy as as being just like, well, Daniel, you're not playing like, right, okay, right. Well, that's how you piss off agents. That's how you fracture stuff. In piss a off a guy room. on your team. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it's not as simple as just doing that. But it's I don't know. It, it's 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 in a weird spot. Yeah, the, look, the, as much as they all, every player ever wants their team to be good and wants to have great relationships with everybody, they're also getting paid. <laughs> and so they have to think about that part as well. Mark, this was a great conversation about the state of this team and the remaining 20-some games, which will be fascinating, right? This whole season, just be, being so far ahead of schedule from a wins perspective and Tyrese being so good has sort of changed the calculus of where the Pacers are and where they're headed in a way that I think we'll learn a lot about down the stretch of the season, especially now that, their trade situation has all been sorted. Where can people follow you, Mark? And the things you have to say about, uh, I guess I'll just say basketball because you cover everything. So I'll just yeah. say basketball. Um, you can find me on Twitter at MG underscore Schindler. Uh, I have a Patreon uh, if you enjoy my work. I am still working to, to make it full time. Um, but yeah, man, uh, this was great. I appreciate you having me on. I always enjoy getting to catch up. It was great. I also enjoy catching up tomorrow. We talk in Pacers, Celtics, and I can't believe the storyline has been buried, but the All-Star break made it happen. Malcolm Brogdon's returning to Indiana on Thursday, uh, so I'll be curious to see how the, the interactions go with him uh, and how, yeah, I'm assuming there'll be a tribute video. He was very good here. Um, and how any sort of things with that go. So we'll, of course, be talking all that. And then next week, diving into their road trip. Mavs, Spurs, all sorts of fun stuff coming here for the Pacers. Thank you guys so much for listening. Have a fantastic rest of your day, and I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>